Good evening, everybody. Oh, geez. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jim Turk. I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event. It's going to be, I think, quite a lively and interesting and dynamic uh, panel discussion. Uh, I want to thank, uh, before we start, uh, Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator of the center, who actually does most of the work that makes all this possible. And I'd also like to thank Winnie Ng, who really was the inspiration for tonight's uh, uh, panel discussion. We have quite a distinguished group of panelists. I'm going to introduce them. It'll take me a minute because they are quite impressive, and I want to share some of that with you. Uh, the first is Chuck Kwan. Uh, do you want to just come up? Uh, Chuck was living in Hong Kong during the, during the 1989 student movement that led to the Tiananmen Square massacre on June 4th, 1989. On his return to Toronto the following year, he joined the Toronto Association for Democracy in China, becoming its chair from 1992 to 2016. He is currently its media spokesperson and is responsible for government and NGO liaison for the association. He's also served on the board of directors of the New York-based Human Rights in China since 1998. Uh, since 1989, the Toronto Association for Democracy in China has held annual memorials on the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square Massacre, hosted and supported prominent Chinese dissidents, and launched domestic and international human rights campaigns with other NGOs, including Amnesty International and Penn Canada. So welcome, Chuck. We're happy to have you with us. Our second panelist is Sanjay Ruparelia. Uh, he's uh, living a dual life at the moment. He's recently been appointed Ryerson University's inaugural Jarolowski Democracy Chair. It's a chair hosted in the Faculty of Arts, and the chair will uh, bring th uh, thought leadership and public profile to pre prof uh, can't even talk to pressing issues around democracy, of which there are no shortage <laughs> these days. Um, he is and has been the, an associate professor of politics at the, New York, at the New School for Social Research in New York, hence the double life, commuting between New York and Toronto. Uh, his research addresses the politics of democracy, equality, and development in the post-colonial world. Uh, the prospects and difficulties of power sharing in federal coalition governments in deeply diverse democracies, and the role of institutions, power, and judgment uh, in politics. Although India has been his primary uh, region of inquiry, his new research encompasses analogous developments in post-Maoist China, a part of a longer-term effort to analyze the trajectory of capitalist development, political contest contestation, and social well-being in both uh, India and China. Our third panelist is Jan Wong. Uh, many of you will know of her. Jan is an award-winning journalist. She's an assistant professor of journalism at St. Thomas University in Fredericton. A third-generation Montrealer, in 1972, Jan became the first Canadian to study in China during the Cultural Revolution. In 1979, she became the first news assistant in Beijing for the New York Times. Jan is a graduate of McGill University, uh, the Beijing University and Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, where she specialized in business reporting. She's worked as a business reporter for the Montreal Gazette, the Boston Globe, and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, from 1988 to 1994, she was the Goldman Mail's much acclaimed China correspondent and covered the 1989 massacre in Tiananmen Square. For six years, she interviewed celebrities for her popular Lunch With column. Her latest book is Apron Strings, Navigating Food and Family in France, Italy, and China. She's the author of five other nonfiction books. Her first, Red China Blues, My Long March from Mao Till Now, was named one of Time Magazine's top 10 books in 1996. Uh, it remains banned in China. <clears throat> Jan is the recipient of the George Polk Award for her Boston Globe Spotlight Team investigation of, money, of a money laundering scandal at the New England banks. In Canada, her honors include a National Newspaper Award in, uh, for her China reporting, a 2011 National Magazine Awards Silver Medal for column writing, 
and the Daily Bread Food Bank Public Education Award for her undercover series of Working as a Maid. So welcome, Jan. It's an honor to have you with us as well. And finally, I'd like to introduce my colleague who will be moderating this group of distinguished panelists, who's quite a remarkable person herself, Lisa Taylor. Uh, I'm going to actually introduce three parts of her life. She's a professor here at Ryerson. She's a professor in, this, in uh, the School of Journalism, where we are right now. Since uh, 2008, she's taught uh, and continues to teach multi-platform journalism and now journalism law and ethics. She's won a number of teaching awards. Uh, she was born and raised in Cape Breton. She previously taught at the University of King's College and at Mount St. Vincent University. Her research interests include state impediments. Why don't you come up so people can see you while I'm talking about you? Um, <laughs> you're getting a double applause, see? Uh, state impediments to journalist freedom of expression and also research on access to information and, and the impediments to that, of which there are many in Canada. She is the co-editor of a book entitled The Unfilled Promise of Press Freedom in Canada, which was published two years ago by the University of Toronto Press. She's a senior fellow here at the Center for Free Expression and a member of the Canadian Association of Journalists Ethics Advisory Committee. She's also a member of the Canadian World of Journalism Study Team, which is an interdisciplinary group uh, that together with researchers from about 70 countries regularly assesses the state of journalism throughout the world. So that's our moderator as professor. She's also a lawyer. Uh, she holds both a, a LLB and a Master of Laws from um, the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. She previously practiced law in a private firm in Halifax, and she's a member of the Law Society of Upper Canada and the Nova Scotia Bar Barrister Society. But in addition to being a professor and a lawyer, she's also a journalist. Uh, she's a former CBC television uh, and radio journalist. Her CBC journalism has been recognized by the Gemini Awards, the Atlantic Journalism Awards, and the B'nai B'rith Media Human Rights Awards. Her independent documentary production work has been recognized by the Ann Arbor Film Festival, the Atlantic Film Festival, and the Yorkton Film Festival. And she continues to lead professional development workshops for CBC journalists across Canada. So, a really impressive moderator, and she will lead this distinguished group through uh, what I hope will be an interesting discussion, and then bring you, the audience, into it. So I'll turn it over to Lisa. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, one other thing. Um, oh, yeah. this, the center has about a dozen panels each year. We also have a film series. Uh, so if you'd like to be on our email list for any of our events, uh, we won't deluge you with emails, but you will get uh, one or two a month. Just put your name and email address on these two uh, uh, clipboards uh, that are going around the room during the talk. So now over to Lisa and the panel. Hey, thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate that. Um, I'm not going to long talk before we get started. I promise you, you've been patient, you've waited, you've got incredible speakers that you're going to hear from. Um, <laughs> classes are ending, people are really excited here. Um, I'm happy to ask, act as the de facto bouncer if we have to quiet people down in there, okay? Um, oh, thank you, Maylin. Uh, okay, there's someone who's going to uh, get things sorted out there. Uh, so we will get to the speakers as soon as possible. I promise you will have an opportunity to engage with the speakers, to ask them questions, to let them know what uh, your concerns are or, or your interests are in relation to this topic. We'll get to that around 8 o'clock or so. Um, when we do, I'm just going to flag this now and I will flag it again later, we'll be asking you for three things. Um, first one will be to try to keep things to questions as opposed to kind of long dissertations or soliloquies. Um, we'll ask that you identify yourself and also that you wait for the microphone. Microphone as usual, yep. Ange Holmes will have the microphone. Just be patient and wait for that. That allows our recording system to pick up what you have to say. So even if you're confident you've got a set of strong lungs, if you could just wait for the mic, that would be fantastic. And uh, the only real ground rule for you guys is to not listen and wait for me. I'm as excited to hear you engage with each other as I am to hear what you have to say to any questions that I may have to ask. So feel free to jump in, to build on ideas, to challenge ideas, to call B Yes, if you feel the need to, whatever it takes. I'm really grateful that you're here. Um, so we're going to start with Jan. And Jan, you know China well. Many of us know China 
through your books. Now, given your unique perspective, I'm really curious to know whether you've observed any change in China over the years insofar as control of speech is concerned. I thought I'd, I'd start by talking about my own experience uh, with China. Uh, so we'll start small, and then we'll open up big. And I think Sanjay will give us an even yeah. bigger view. But I want to start by talking about my journey to China in 1972. And that's in the context of China's attempt to influence the world, the external world. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s, when the Communist Party took control of China, there were some Westerners uh, being invited in, but I don't think any Canadians. And in 1972, I was a 19-year-old from McGill University. To save you the math, I'm 66. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I'm 66, yeah, I know. And I'm on my summer vacation, and I can't do math because I've been here too many generations. Math gene is done. <laughs> so I am in Asian studies. I don't really know what that is, but that's what I'm doing. And I don't speak Mandarin. And so one of my pals at McGill says, let's go to China. She's not ethnically Chinese. She gets turned down. She doesn't get a visa. I get a visa. And I decide, do I go by myself? But that's the first inkling I have that China is sort of targeting a certain group. I don't really get it because I'm 19. And, and I like China because I think they're going to be better than the West. I am a typical university student of 1972. We are sitting in. We are striking. Uh, we think we're going to build a better world. And we look to the other side, to a place where they're proclaiming men and women are equal, no more exploitation, all that stuff. So I go to China by myself with um, Mandarin 101 under my belt from McGill. <laughs> Terrible. And I can't say anything, and I can hardly understand anything. And I want to learn Chinese. And everywhere I go, I ask the guide, who doesn't speak any English, basically, because I'm ethnic Chinese, so they put me with the Chinese travel service. They never met anybody like me who doesn't speak Chinese who looks like me. It was very strange. I kept saying, I want to learn Chinese. And they said, no. No one here wants to teach Chinese, because it's a cultural revolution. And, uh, but then suddenly, one day, I'm in Beijing. And they say to me, OK, you can study Chinese. And I say, great. Like, where? Oh, you just wait. You know, wait, wait, sit. So I wait in my hotel by myself for a month. <laughs> I know. I didn't think it was funny at the time. There's nothing to do in China. There's hardly any books in English. And I read Kim Il-sung. That's the, father, the grandfather of Kim Jong-un. I read his autobiography several times in English. Didn't get any better. And then I went to study in China. In, in at Peking University. I'm the first Canadian to study there. And I don't really get it. And only much later, many years later, I'm sort of writing my first book. And I'm trying to figure out what happened. And, I, and it hits me. They think that I'm going to be their ally. I'm their point of influence. They have something called the United Front in China. And so even though I'm a capitalist bourgeois kid from the West, they think of me as a potential uh, united Front tool, that if they can shape me, uh, I can be their kind of stealth influencer in the West. And I'm quite happy to do things like that, because I think Maoism is fan fantastic. And, uh, but luckily, I stay in China long enough. I stay one year. They almost kick me out, by the way. I almost get expelled. I do get expelled, and then they change their minds. Because all this stuff is happening at the very top, and I mean Premier Zhou Enlai. Uh, is the one who approved me to study there. Because he thinks, OK, Canadian, you know, ethnic Chinese, maybe. And so um, I, I go back as an official Canadian exchange student. I get my Mandarin in shape. But as I stay there longer, I, I start to get it. Because the, when they almost kicked me out, it was because they told me I couldn't see this Swedish diplomat who was almost my only friend in Beijing at the time, so pathetic. And I said, OK, I won't see him. You know, The party is telling me not to see him. OK, I won't see him. 
But I went to see another English teacher at the Friendship Hotel, and you have to sign in. There's controls. I sign in at the gate. There's a soldier. I sign in. I get to the English teacher's house, and the Swedish friend is there. So it's like, oh, I said I wouldn't see you. But we both signed in. So he takes off right away. One of us takes off right away so we don't get into trouble. But that's the control. They knew that we had both signed in at the same time. So I had broken this terrible rule. And so the next thing I know, they come to me and say, OK, your studies are over. And it's January. And, and then they tried to tell me that I'd always asked to leave in January. And I was like, but if I go back to McGill, I'm totally humiliated. How, how am I going to show up at McGill at February? So, and my roommate and all the Chinese kids on my floor said, yes, you, you said you were going to go. And the only American Chinese there said to me, no, you didn't. Like, that was my first experience at the brainwashing. And it was my first glimpse of, this is a really nutty place. And they're trying to influence people. But they do such a bad job of it. And so I'm going to end there, because we're going to talk about the modern day. But I want to tell you, that's, that's how crude it was in 1972. And they decided not to expel me, because somebody at McGill told them, actually, you know, she can be very helpful to you in the future. I think that's what he said. So they changed their mind. It was Professor Paul Lin, who was very close to the Chinese government. And so it was quite crude. And I guess they thought I was going to be their best friend forever. So we'll, I'll just um, stop talking now. And we'll, we'll, Chuck will tell you about the big picture in the modern era. But that's how it started with me. Yeah, and Chuck, can we take this kind of going forward from the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre and looking at how China has influenced or attempted to influence public opinion and political narrative here in Canada? Yeah, this is where I come in up right after Jan. Is, <laughs> um, and I was just talking to somebody out there, and we were talking about how long I've been uh, with the uh, chairmanship of uh, um, the, the association, and I thought, what I'm going to talk about tonight is all the subtext that goes behind our annual memorial. I'm, I'm, our memorial is every once a year, June 4th. You know, we come up with an exhibition. We come up with a candlelight vigil. We want to remind Canadians not to forget. And we want to remind the world not to forget what happened in Tiananmen Square on June 4th, or the week, or night of June 3rd and June 4th. But come back to think about it. Those are s s relatively easy stuff. You know, all you do is organize f f several hundred people, raise money to build a statue at, at the U of T, and, and so forth. The subtext is much more difficult. This is, the, this is the kind of underground fight, like almost like fighting under the water that you don't see anything, but it's a submarine fight among uh, the United Front Forces of the Chinese Consulate and the Chinese Embassy in Ottawa with the so-called community, the media, and, and so forth. Basically, it's the, it's the influence and the shaping of a narrative and the affecting of our political leaders and, um, um, and our government views of what China is all about. And this is basically. Uh, the, 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 the grandchildren of what they've done to Jan Wong. So there are many Jan Wongs around the world now. And there are a lot of Jan Wongs here, not necessarily Chinese Canadians. There are a lot of, shall I say, white politicians um, that are kind of almost being what I call, quote unquote, a, a, an agent of influence uh, for the Chinese government. So that's why I'm, I was going to talk about this tonight. Uh, in response to questions and answers. But basically, uh, what I want to go back to is um, I'm going to talk about this period in, in three period, three kind of milestones. The first milestone was the five years after 1989, so 1990 to 95. This is what I call uh, damage control by the Chinese government. Basically, their, 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 their reputation has been ruined. By, by the tanks and the killings in, on the, on the, in the square. So they have to do a, a quick kind of turnaround and 
making sure to turn, to turn around the, uh, the world opinion against them. And I was actually doing a lot of lobbying at the, at the Human Rights uh, Commission in Geneva. Year after year, we've been uh, doing that. And you can see the kind of political force the Chinese are doing around the world. They're buying up with money, literally, with money and projects and loans, buying up all the African votes, buying up all the Latin American votes to counteract the Western vote, Western bloc. And they were using Airbus versus Boeing uh, as a threat to, uh, to the EU, saying, if you support uh, this res resolution condemning China, then I will, we will buy all the planes from Boeing and vice versa, right? So this is splitting out the West. So this is what China was doing. The next stage comes in 2008, in the run-up to China, uh, Beijing Olympics. That's when they really solidify the United Front, both within the Chinese Canadian community and also uh, trying to turn the opinion of Canadian society. Basically, if you remember, uh, Stephen Harper at that time was thinking about boycotting uh, the Beijing Olympics because of human rights violation. So there were mass protests organized behind the, behind the scene by the Chinese consulate and embassy to bus people up to Parliament Hill to do a a demonstration with waving Canadian and Chinese flag in equal parts. And this is something that I think Jen Wong and I were on a TVO show, and we talk about that. Actually, we confronted the person who was sewing the flags that night, the Chinese flags. They couldn't get enough Chinese flags. So anyway, so that's kind of uh, molding and shaping of, uh, of public opinion uh, by the Chinese uh, government. And the third phase is what I call the superpower phase. This is the Huawei, the 5G dominance, the one belt, one road uh, system of uh, building ports all the way to Athens, to Greece, and then I think it was to Friesburg. You were saying that to Friesburg in Germany. Uh, and I, I was watching the, uh, one of these uh, murder mystery in, in uh, Netflix about Iceland, and there was an episode about how the Chinese were buying up the, port, the, the local port uh, because they're going to do the polar route. Chinese are now dominate. They have such a huge icebreaker right now that there have been several TV shows about Madame Secretary has an has a episode on Chinese icebreaker <laughs> going through the polar route and saving some Soviet ships or whatever it may be. And then this Iceland episode has, uh, has, has a government, local government selling the port and to a 99-year lease to China, China, which actually happened, right? So, so this is the kind of thing that uh, I, I will allude to in my talk, and I won't say any more, but that's the three phases and what I call the three milestones of, of um, Chinese influence. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Sanjay, uh, Jan suggested that perhaps you would give us the view from 30,000 feet, which was, I think, a, a kind of an important thing to hear. So. You know, Chuck's described a little of what's happening, you know, what China is doing to kind of control the narrative. Um, but why and how is this happening? Yeah. So um, I'm the least directly qualified experience to talk about this issue, which is why I can give a 30,000 foot view, because I haven't had either of the experiences of Chuck or John. So let me start by saying, um, I think, I. Maybe to set up a conversation. Um, I mean, I agree with a lot of what was said, but I think there are some ways in which we might think about things differently. So the first would be, if I put it in the form of a question, you know, is the Chinese state or is the Communist Party of China, are its activities the same over this entire period or not? Its attitude towards rights and dissent and so on. And I think most scholars would say it has not been the same. So from 19, if you look in the 1980s, there's actually a remarkable opening up in China um, of various questions, which is actually encouraged actively by Deng Xiaoping. Uh, there's a 1982 constitution. There is a new civil procedure law, so that resolutions of conflicts are not resolved simply by mediation. There is a, a remarkable law uh, implemented in 1989 called Administrative Litigation Law. This all sounds too technical, but it's important because it's a law that Beijing passes 
encouraging citizens to report acts of corruption and violations of law by members of the party in localities. And what you see in the 1990s, post Tiananmen, is a remarkable wave of lawsuits against corrupt party officials, actively encouraged by Beijing. You see a lawyer's law that makes it legitimate for lawyers to practice the law. You see a whole series of developments um, in the realm of personal freedom for most Chinese scholars that I've spoken to, where in Beijing University, there's a lot more space to speak freely. That's changed now. But I think historicizing this is really important. And I think this opening up that you see, this expansion of rights, activism, in many cases encouraged by the state. I can give examples, and we discuss this further that some of the rights activists that the regime has targeted in the last 10 years were valorized by the same regime before 2004. We can't, if, if we don't see that, we don't see how complicated and complex the situation is. And I think, so I think the first point to make is from the late 1970s till about 2004, with a huge caveat, which had to do with the question of democracy, can you challenge the party supremacy? Can you challenge the fact that China should be or should not be an electoral democracy. On that question, the regime has always been incredibly heavy-handed and repressive from Tiananmen before and after. But on questions of civil liberties, personal freedoms, social dissent, the question of law, of course, it became rule by law. But the fact that they wanted to expand the realm of law says that this is actually a more complicated regime. This is not simply an arbitrary despotic regime, if I want to try to be provocative about it. In fact, under Deng Xiaoping, it was exactly the worry and the attempt to make sure that you did not have the Cultural Revolution again, which was arbitrary. That's why he was so insistent that there's a new constitution, there's a new regime of law, that the actions of the state could not be purely arbitrary. We see a massive difference post-2004, where there's so much litigation, there's so much social dissent, there's so much popular mobilization, which the regime, again, actively encouraged for a decade and a half post Tiananmen, that it begins to worry that it's going to hurt the regime's uh, ability to, to rule and control that society. So I think one thing we need to do is historicize the regime and its attitude towards rights and, and, and social mobilization and so on. I think the second question is, what's China doing to frame its image abroad? So here I think I would like to unpack and disentangle a lot of activities um, like the Belt and Road Initiative, the fact that they want to create um, new international institutions like the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, for instance, and so on. And let us ask the question, what is China doing that's different from other aspiring or great powers? What is it that other states do? Every state that I can think of that's a great power or is seeking to be a great power tries to shape its image abroad, starting with the one that I've lived in for the last 20 years, the United States more than anyone. Right? So this is something all states do. It is also the case that, particularly in the last two decades, so here I think we need to expand the conversation beyond China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, South Africa, Turkey, all of these emerging powers in the uh, what we call the developing world, the global south, the post-colonial world, and the post-colonial is really important adjective because most of these places were colonized right, by European powers, have been seeking to change the international order because this international order, when we always say it's a rules-based international order, it was defined and created by the West in 1945. And from a southern perspective, certainly if you look at the question of development, it has not been one that has been purely fair and symmetric across these north-south divides, as we know. It was in the 1970s that most of the poorest countries in the world created something called the G77 and called for a new international economic order. The reason why so many countries were very happy initially to sign up to Belt and Road is precisely because China was offering investment and trade in pretty much the same way that most Western powers have been doing since the 1980s. And the use of spycraft or soft power or economic coercion, which Chuck's absolutely right, China is doing. I mean, pretty hard pressed to think that the United States wasn't doing that or hasn't been doing that, that France doesn't do it in the Francophonie, that Britain still doesn't try to do that. You have to listen to the debates on Brexit and global Britain, 
I find it astonishing as somebody of Indian origin to hear someone like Boris Johnson talk about global Britain. Global Britain was the Pax Britannica. <laughs> it's not very popular in a place like India or the subcontinent. So I think these kinds of questions are actually quite difficult and complex. And so we need to sort of disentangle them. I think that's the second sort of point. Third point, which is the one which is what the, the talk today has been focused on, which is about academic freedom and what China is doing abroad. So here, I absolutely agree that a lot of the events and developments that we've seen of China trying to silence political criticism and social dissent abroad is extremely troubling, extremely disconcerting, and should be resisted. So just so there's no, uh, after, after having said those sort of two broad points, there, shouldn't be, there should be no misunderstanding about how I feel about that or how I imagine most of us feel. And I think that in itself is a very striking fact. Um, so the question is why? Mm -hmm. And I think that on the one hand, that is something that's unsurprising. It's a communist party state. It believes that the party is a supreme power. It's a party that defines the monopoly of truth. It believes in a principle of democratic centralism. Uh, so all debates can happen within the party, behind closed doors, but then it must present a united front to use a different interpretation of that work, of that, of that phrase. And I think in that sense, it's absolutely crucial that those um, initiatives are resisted. And it's actually surprising because China itself, like India, so I'll give an example of a country that's the world's largest democracy, both insist that sovereignty non-interference because of two, decades, two centuries of colonial experience by the West is a crucial principle of international order in their desire to create a post-Western order. So it's really surprising that China, this is what puzzles me actually, a state that emphasizes sovereignty and non-interference would be doing these things here and elsewhere. Again, in the caveat, we should compare how what other states are doing. So that's the first point on that. And the second one I would say is actually something different, is that to see China so uh, actively repressing political dissent and social opposition in China and now increasingly abroad tells you something, which is how fragile the state ruling elite actually must feel. Because if you're so worried about dissidents and lawyers and uh, you know, social activists tweeting that things are not well in China, let alone abroad, it, it tells you this paradox of an incredibly powerful state apparatus, kind of phenomenal state apparatus, actually. I mean, if you just for a moment think as a Machiavellian, you know, that just as, as, a, as, a, as a state apparatus, it's quite an astonishing apparatus to study. And of course, God forbid, if you're on the wrong side of it. But the fact that they're clamping down so hard tells you that actually there's a great fear in that ruling elite of what it would mean if dissent was to break open. And there, of course, what they're worried about is what happened at the end of the 1980s with uh, Glasnost and Perestroika under Gorbachev, even though it's a quite a different regime. Mm -hmm. So I'll sort of stop there. Uh, Chuck, when Sanjay was talking about um, the, the Chinese preoccupation with kind of with influence beyond its borders. I mean, of course, here in Canada and in many countries throughout the world, the first thing that comes to mind um, is the Confucius Institutes. And Confucius Institutes, language and cultural entities that exist often attached to post-secondary institutions uh, throughout the world. Now, you played an active role in um, encouraging the TDSB to disengage itself from right. Confucius Institutes. Uh, tell, tell us a bit about what what is happening, you know, why, well, first of all, can we start with, how did something like the Confucius Institute find such a welcoming home in so many leading post-secondary institutions? Well, first of all, it's the money. Mm -hmm. uh, they will provide. Can you explain what the Confucius Institute okay. is? Okay, Confucius Institutes like Goethe Institute or Alliance Francaise. So they're basically a Chinese language and cultural uh, association or, 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 or institution. But uh, instead of one, one in every city, what they do is they attach to a university, McMaster, Brock, um, U of T, and then re most recently in New Brunswick, Fredericton. Yeah, in New Brunswick, they're in 
elementary schools. Yeah. So it's very interesting. So their modus operandi is that we will provide you, uh, if you give us 200000 a year of office space and whatnot, allow us to set, set up shop in your, on your campus, we will give you unlimit, almost unlimited number of uh, Mandarin teachers. So basically, we will give you uh, classes after hours or heritage language class on Saturdays. And what, what it is is that uh, you know, the TDSB, Toronto District School Board, has a massive number of Mandarin language classes. But before, maybe about five years ago, it was all uh, staffed by people from Taiwan. Uh, people, people who are Canadians who happen to be uh, speak Chinese, they can then, you know, do a job of part-time job of teaching Mandarin uh, or Cantonese to to the students. Uh, what Confucius Institute does is, well, you don't have to hire these people anymore. We have the expertise of Mandarin. We're going to. Part of it is that they want to displace Cantonese as the uh, de facto uh, Chinese dialect spoken in uh, in Toronto, for example, and this has many kind of underlying factors to it. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that later. So they're offering this sweet, very sweet deal of saying, hey, we will run your, all your Mandarin language classes mm -hmm. in your schools and on campus and so forth. Um, so that's the Confucius Institute. And I was one, one of the 10, to the five against and five pro, selected by the, uh, at that time, it was the uh, board of trustee of the TDSB. They were having one final meeting to, to decide, because there were a lot of protests from Tibetans, from Uyghurs, uh, from a lot of Chinese dissidents saying, you should not have that uh, on campus. And I think we need to explain why, though. Mm -hmm. Why do you not want free Chinese lessons? It's because they don't just come in with free Chinese lessons. They say, you can't talk about Tibet. Right. Uh, you can't talk about human, yeah. OK. You can't talk about you know, you can't talk Very about typical human Jan. rights. She just interrupts and takes over a narrative. <laughs> I got to fix it, Chuck. I'm <laughs> editing you as you talk. And I'm like, wait, you have to explain Confucius. Wait, you have to say this. No, I think yeah, that's the go reason, go. right? No, yes. That it's not just that you get free Chinese lessons and you know, culture. Because there's they, a censorship aspect. They displace all the Taiwanese textbooks. Uh, TDSB used to get its Mandarin or uh, Chinese language textbooks from Singapore. Because Singapore is known to be more neutral. It's not Taiwan nor China. Uh, and and in, in that sense, um, uh, it's, it's seen to be neutral uh, or cheaper books as well. However, if you look at the Confucius Institute book imported directly from China, there are a lot of what I call, there is a communist ideology in there like live, long live the people or you know, uphold the party. Maybe not that much, but you know, <laughs> uphold socialism, you know, that kind of thing, right? And, and one of the parents would say, where's the st Statue of Liberty? You know, in, in most books that you talk about you know, Statue of Liberty and all that stuff. So, so the concept of freedom and, and dissent are not discussed at all, even in, in diagrams or in, in any of these. So that's, a, that's, that's a, con a context of the whole thing. So, well, I was one of the opposing uh, intervener at the, at the board meeting. So I made my piece. And I could not go in there as Toronto Association of Democracy in China, because I would be vetoed right out. So I used another subtext. I used another organization and went in there as um, Harmony or whatever it may be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then um, our argument was exactly what uh, Sanjay was alluding to. Every single country seeks to influence uh, 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 in a foreign country. Your, your ideology, your, your promoting capitalism if you're from the States, uh, and so forth. And you're promoting French culture. However, our argument is that unlike Goethe Institute or Alliance Francaise, Confucius Institute are run by the Chinese government as part of the Ministry of Propaganda Department. And they have, and Chinese government is not a democratic government. You cannot change that government if you don't like it. So 
you know, if, if, if the French government does something bad, we can always say, well, you know, we don't, you know, Alliance Francaise doesn't have to follow it. But the Chinese Confucian Institute is basically an extension of the Chinese government. Can I ask you a question? Yes. So I agree with everything you just said about comparing these two regimes. But let's say I go into the Alliance Francaise, and I say, let's imagine Emmanuel Macron was not elected a year ago. So I think he's the first French president to apologize for what happened in Algeria. Yeah, mm -hmm. he is. Right? Yeah. So let's say I go into the Alliance Francaise, and I say, I want to discuss French colonial policy in Algeria in the Civil War. Is that the kind of discussion that the Alliance Francaise will have? I completely agree with you, just so there's no misunderstanding in this room, that what is happening in Xinjiang, what is happening in Tibet, what is happening with all the dissidents that we read about is absolutely uh, is deplorable. No, it won't happen. No, but here's the no, thing. No, but, but, with the but Confucius this is Institute, this is they're important. in the schools. Right. Jen, I'm going to get to that because I want to hear loads about New Brunswick. So just, let's, yeah. just want to hear this thought finished. No, I, really so quickly. I'm just saying, I, I think that I think what I, what I wanted to raise for everyone to think about is, is that unless we put it into a comparative broader context, there is a danger of both missing what other states are doing. So if we find this problematic, then are we finding what other practices are problematic? Tell you the truth? Uh, it's not the same. No, wait, no, no. The, it's the, not the same. Uh, Alliance okay. Francaise, yeah. it's can a standalone, and if you want to go, you go. If you feel an urge to go and find out about French culture, you go to the Alliance Francaise. Right. The difference with the Confucius Institute is they are embedded in our educational institutions. That's completely different. So, and, and to answer your question directly on your Algerian war, mm -hmm. I'm, I don't think you have with any problem with any teachers in Alliance Francaise trying to impose their so-called colonial Mentality. They will not stop you from doing that. But I'm asking the teacher, no, know. yeah, they will not. The teachers of Confucian Institute is under law, under firing, to not discuss anything that are Tibetans, Uyghurs, and whatnot. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a difference. And the arms length of Alliance Francaise, yes, is getting a lot of money from USA, from a French propaganda department, but it operates basically as a. Um, uh, um, fairly independent entity, un unlike a, the Ministry of Propaganda. I read, I had a copy of the uh, contract between TDSB and, and, and uh, Confucius Institute. It was three or four pages of poorly typewritten note. And at the bottom it says, this contract sh should be uh, I don't know what the legal thing is, that this, the, the Chinese law uh, is... is uh, applies. La, uh, applies. Instead what? of Ontario law. Instead of... Uh, oh, the yeah. Ontario law should be the... You know, instead of yeah. Ontario law, you should say Chinese law. You know okay? what's interesting? That's how is bad it is. It, it yeah. looks like a Gotha Institute, and it looks like an Alliance Francaise, and they're, they're not. They would like you to think that that's what they are, but they're not. And so... By well, embedding I, not, in the schools, that you don't come to them; they're in your house. So I'm not. I'm not disagreeing that that there is. Um, but you you think there's a similarity, and I'm telling you, well, and Chuck is telling you they're different animals. Well, I think I think that I think what I'm trying to ask is: is it really black and white, or are they on a spectrum? They've crossed the line. I agree with you on that. That they are Nothing basically. Nothing is black and white. Well, but that's I think how a lot of the conversation has been taking place on these issues. Yes, it I is. see a conflation of a lot of things that are actually separate. For instance, right? so they that, don't want the teachers at the Confucius Institute to be any uh, to have membership in Falun Gong, mm -hmm. right? Falun Gong is a banned organization. I don't think that the Alliance Francaise does a political check on the teachers who come here. They don't, they which, don't have which a, means they're allowed to bring up Algerian war if they yeah, want. Yeah, they right. feel like So it, there's not a dogmatic uh, way of right. treating uh, the French colonization versus what the Chinese ideology is right now. Okay, so there's a big difference. Gentlemen, I appreciate all the context that you've added to this. And I really appreciate, yes, the observation that this is not black and white. These, these entities will exist in some form of continuum. I understand why, um, why the Confucius Institute may wish to um, find a home at U of T or at McMaster. 
um, or even in a you know in a multi uh, in a multicultural city like Toronto in the public school system, New Brunswick, the homogenous largely homogenous Maritimes. Mm -hmm. What's the end game for China or for the Confucius Institute to land in Bucktush, New Brunswick, and try yeah, to proselytize? Really, it well, uh, it confounds know, it comes, me. It comes down to uh, one Canadian Chinese man who has. Uh, a lot of business in New Brunswick. But why are they there? They're in this uh, public school system. They're not in the universities. They're in 40 schools, more than 5,000 New Brunswick um, children are being taught uh, Chinese. Now, I think Chinese is a very important language. These are free lessons. So I like to get free stuff because I'm Chinese. I'm kidding. <laughs> I know, you can hiss. Uh, but so they're, they're free lessons. So what, do, what does New Brunswick do? And in the last contract, they used to have any, but you could cancel at any time. Now there's punitive clauses. This is so interesting because other places like McMaster have kicked them out. So now the Confucius Institute in New Brunswick has punitive clauses. Uh, you have to, the, the host, New Brunswick host people have to pay all the expenses. Uh, all, they have to cover everything, all the damages and any libel. If there's any libel of the Chinese government, <laughs> New Brunswick is responsible. So they've, they've gotten claws in there now. And uh, we have an interesting political situation in New Brunswick. Nobody ever heard of New Brunswick, but I work there half the year, so I, I now know a little bit about it. But the Minister of Education, Dominic Cardi, Kind of an interesting guy, switch parties. and mm -hmm. He used to work for NGOs. I don't know. He's got this interesting background. So he's, he said he's going to close the Confucius Institutes. He didn't check with the premier, who is uh, you know, kind, of like, kind of like the Ontario premier, only a little better educated. <laughs> <laughs> and the premier of New Brunswick is worried about business. He's worried about the backlash. We already saw what happened to Canola. With, during this Huawei tension. And so they're worried about New Brunswick lobster. It's a problem, right? But I told them, don't worry, because it's the Politburo that wants to eat the lobster. Yeah. But so we have this ongoing real debate now in the schools. And some parents are just sort of waking up to the fact that they, you can't talk about Tibet. You can't talk about the Muslim minority. So they're just trying to deal with it without offending China, without having to pay punitive damages. The contracts run until 2022, which is just around the corner, right? It's two more years. But it's a real live, ongoing situation, and, and nobody quite knows what to do. In New Brunswick, they're very innocent, because as you point out, it's not really multicultural. It's essentially very white, very white place. And so they, they don't know their innocence. They don't get it. They don't have Chuck there to be <laughs> warning them, like, watch out. Like, you don't want to do this. They don't have anybody there, so it's kind of, uh, it's kind of very interesting because it's developing as we talk right now. Yeah. Just to, just to give you the, the high-handed way or soft power way of, of how China is dealing with, just one little thing called Confucius Institute. It's not much in the big scheme of things, but the chair at that time, the chair of the Board of Trustees is uh, Chris Bolton. He's been wine and dined by the Chinese government. He was brought into the ten, people's, uh, people's Hall have a banquet with the very high top level of Chinese government. And he's only a chair of, of ha, happens to be a larger school board, but still a school board chair. You know, that doesn't have any economic clout in anything. And he's being wine and dine. He's got three or four trips paid for by the Chinese government. Going there, and, and then finally he came back and said, OK, we're now going to bring in the Confucius Institute. I want to explain the roots of this. It's, you know, in journalism, we always follow the money. Where did these Confucius Institutes start? Where did it come from? Well, it turns out at my tiny little university that's, that no one's ever heard of, St. Thomas University, some of the you know, VPs, and they started doing, getting these free trips to China. This is how it started. They got these free, all expenses paid trips to China, wined and dined, treated like really big shots. I mean, New Brunswick, right? A, a, a university no one ever heard of. They're, they're wined and dined, and the next thing you know, they're signing these contracts. And because New Brunswick is such a small place, 
the people at the university all have connections to the government and to the Ministry of Education. And the latest is, I brought this guy into, I teach interviewing, so I brought a, a, a defeated premier of New Brunswick into my students so they could interview him. You can do this in New Brunswick because everybody knows everybody and big deal. So he came in and one of the most interesting things he said to me, he's worried about China taking offense at the Confucius Institute because he does business. But what he told me is the next project that New Brunswick wants to do is import Chinese high school students. And when I say import, I mean really import them. Their parents will send them over. Why? Because we have clean air. We have clean air in New Brunswick. They can go to school. And so they're going to live with families. They're going to be a huge source of income. The only problem is New Brunswick has to change its laws. Because right now, Ontario, if you come as a foreign student to high school, you, you can pay a fee. In New Brunswick, it's illegal. We can't charge people for high school. So they're just going to fix that. That will not be a problem. It's all the politicians. But they're all getting their trips. They're all getting trips to China. OK. So Sanjay, I'm so glad you're here, because when we talk about foreign entities whining and dining people to do establish I, I relationships, say, when we day. talk about foreign students coming yeah. in to help economies, especially in places where the population is declining, I think this needs a shot of context. What would you say? Well, everything you just said, I mean, I agree with you. Everything that you find troubling about barring discussion of what the Chinese government thinks of as sensitive issues is really troubling and should be resisted. But otherwise, almost everything that was said, I would substitute United States and Great Britain and France. They apply economic coercion in many places, right? I mean. The idea that, let's, let's give you an example. Go back to the 1980s. Imagine you live in Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa after the debt crisis. And the World Bank and the IMF go in. And they're run by basically the France, is basically always appointing the IMF. And America is appointing the World Bank president. And they impose structural adjustment. So all the things we're worried about, about making sure, I mean, where are the elites being trained? in US universities? Where do they go back to spread this orthodoxy of structural adjustment in their own ministries of finance? I mean, the, what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is the things that concern us should concern us, right, about repression, about cracking down on minorities, and so on. But the actions of the Chinese state as a state, I really don't see how much difference there is to how the United States, for instance, has behaved in many places around the world continuing to the present, right? I mean, the idea of bringing the elites of a country to your universities, training them, making sure they're back in very high levels of power in the countries they're from. I mean, this is what imperial powers do. One example, we have a phrase called the Chicago Boys. Everyone heard of this? These are monetary economists, right, who trained the University of Chicago at the hands of Milton Friedman and others. They went back, and if you look at the histories of the debt crisis in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, the lost decade, because those policies were so backward, took 20 years for the World Bank to fess up to that. Who was implementing these policies in these places? People trained at these institutions in the United States. I, I, and so, yeah. so this training of elites, this, willing, this, this desire to shape the image of the US or Britain and these, and these other countries is something that all great powers and aspiring states do. So in that sense, all I was asking is that when we talk about this, it's not a singular focus simply on China. Because if we do that, there's a danger of conflating things that actually should be kept separate and of vilifying or demonizing some actions, which actually then if, that's, if it's problematic for China to do that, it's problematic for India to do it, it's problematic for Brazil to do it, and it's definitely problematic for the United States or Canada or Britain to do that. Tide aid, that's a phrase we, I remember growing up in Canada in the 1980s, was, it, was there Tide aid? We'll give you aid, but you've got to take Canadian wheat from Saskatchewan. I mean, these are, these are, these are sort of instruments I, of statecraft. I, I, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, this is what, you know what Snowden was doing in Hawaii before he went to Hong Kong? He was cyber attacking China from, from, a, from a silo in Hawaii. They were planning, all, if, you, if you see the movie or if you've seen any of his writing, you know that what he was doing was cyber attack in China. So obviously, you know, we don't have a high moral ground on this. 
uh, compared to what what we accused Huawei of. There's I, a difference, I though. It, I said, I, no, no, let me finish. Power. Abs I said, absolutely No, agree. I can talk, too. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. But I'm what I'm trying to too. say, and what I'm I, trying to you're say is that no, no, there's a moral The cross talk is not going to do it. The you're cross saying, talk, you, you're there, the and here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to just... Fin finish the thought. Forty-five okay. seconds. With Forty-five him. Why seconds. Do we need to hear it twice? No, 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 Forty-five no, no. seconds. I'm with you. I point. promise. Counting okay, it down. Chat. Okay. The Confucius Institute. The argument I argue about between the difference between Goethe and and Confucius Institute is the the, the, the so-called equi false equivalency, mm -hmm. and this is something that I find sometimes. Excuse me, but sometimes a lot of people do not see that. I mean, they're, obviously, they're doing the same thing, in, in, imperial influence versus uh, Chinese imperialism. But the, the, the kind of overall um, power that China now holds with its trade, with its money, they can pretty much do a lot of damage in, in the country where, where they're operating. So. OK. And that was 23. I love when the panel gets to the point that you have to haul out the stopwatch. You're on, Jan. Please. For how long? No, we no. Promise. I just, I, we prom I, I, I'm the only one. No, no, no. You There's three people up here, but every time I open my mouth, you say, oh, don't let, you have, no, I'm sorry. Okay. The, the I'm up here, too. The timer is not for you. You're on. The timer Good. is for Chuck. Go. I think that you're right when you say a great power wants to influence. There's a big difference, though, when they're a totalitarian dictatorship and when they don't have a free press. So you're not comparing apples and apples. You are comparing apples and oranges. And there are similarities. They're both fruit. I'll give you that. <laughs> but the difference is in China, if you're a reporter, you're tailed all the time. I don't think Ottawa is tailing the foreign correspondents in Canada. We don't have if, enough foreign correspondents. Well, the, <laughs> yeah, nobody really cares. Yeah. But I, if you're in Washington, I also don't think it's the same at all. I mean, I've worked in the States, and I don't think anyone ever followed me. I've worked at three um, we're not, we're newspapers. Not, Let not. me finish, right? Yep. Hello? Keep going. Yeah, I'm with you. OK. Go. The difference is when you are, China is really worried about the press it gets. Of course, every power worries about their bad press. But in China's case, they will retaliate. They will not give you a visa. They will kick you out. I don't think we've kicked out a correspondent. I don't think DC has kicked out a correspondent. It's, we're really talking about apples and oranges. And you know we don't want to be anti-China. China's just beginning to flex its muscles after centuries of being the poor and sick man of Asia. But we, we can't lose sight of the repression of freedom of speech there and how now they repress it in their country. They have incredible technology and facial recognition. And there are stores there. My son was studying there. He went into a convenience store, and he was shocked there was no one in there. And he was a little spooked, so he didn't buy anything. But there isn't any theft, because they will see you, and they will track you back to your house where you are. So we're talking about a whole different level of control of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of movement, and surveillance of its citizens. And we should not really get too involved like we're both fruit. We have to understand it's a different beast there. I'll I'm done. Just one second. I'm no, finished. No, 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 in fact, I want to ask you one more thing. That suppression of speech that, that, you, that you're mm -hmm. speaking about, has that been a constant over the past couple of decades, or do we see an ebb and flow in it? Well, you pointed out quite correctly that there were some relaxations and opening up. And I agree with you. When Deng Xiaoping came in, um, after Chairman Mao died in 76 and, and Deng came in, there was an opening up. He was welcomed to the US. And things got a little freer, but not in terms of criticizing the government. Because I covered Democracy Wall there. I interviewed the dissidents. I was just a lowly news assistant at the New York Times. But I, I did meet all these people. There was an ebb and flow to it. But right now, it's really, really bad. And, I, I, and, and Xi Jinping has declared yeah. himself like no term limit. No, no, since 2013, I absolutely agree. It, the turn happened 2004 or 5, and it got much worse 2013. I'll give you a very simple example. I won a grant to go and study rights activism in India and China in 2012. I was really excited. I, in 2012, I won a grant to go and compare rights activism and legal change, rights activism, legal change in India and China. I was really thrilled. I've been visiting China since 2008. I finally was going to do some comparative work. Who gave work. you the grant? SSRC. Oh. 
uh, Social Science you Research Council. I was interrupt. And, um, and, and Xi Jinping came in. It was the 30th anniversary of the Constitution in 1982. And people initially thought that actually this was a period of political liberalization again after the who, when regime of 10 years, right? And the, one of the first things he did was he issued the seven don't mentions. Don't mention the following words. Civil society, rule of law, independent judiciary, constitutionalism, universal values. I was in big trouble because these were the key words of my <laughs> grant document. So I experienced what you're talking about. I had to, I had to interview rights dissidents uh, with no recorders, no paper. They were worried about certain days because they knew our phones would be tapped. We had to, I, I met some of them in Beijing. It was a very repressive atmosphere. I showed up my hotel the first night after having all my stuff confiscated through Beijing airport. Luckily, they didn't go through my notes, uh, which had all kinds of things that got, probably gotten me into trouble. And my door was ajar. I mean, I've had all these kinds of experiences. So I think, I. I, we do have disagreements, but I just want to be clear about where the disagreements lie. Not for a moment saying that this is all the things that we're talking about not incredibly troubling. But I do actually, I would push back and say, I don't think it's black and white. I mean, if you ask people who are in these countries, ask somebody who's been at the blunt end of US imperial power in, in Latin America or Africa, and try to, and, and, and say, okay, you can say all you want, say, well, there's a constitution in the United States and there's a rule of law and the New York Times journalists will, well, they're not going to be tailed by somebody in the State Department. You know, if you're in one of these countries, economic coercion is pretty powerful. When the US comes in and says, I spent a year in Afghanistan, 2006, I can tell you that there's not much that could happen in Afghanistan if the US State Department and the Pentagon did not want it to happen. It doesn't matter how many New York Times reporters are there or the Washington Post. We hear about it. So that's the difference. We have press freedom so that we hear about those, about all those, uh, you know, violations. But, but, I, the, but I, the state was yeah, acting. Can, okay, the good. state was acting. Just wrap it up there if you in can. In that way. Yeah. I, I, I go back to the apples and oranges. Yes, there, it is true. But the thing you need to know is, have you heard of Xinjiang 13? These are 13 professors from the U.S. who wrote. A edit, uh, anthology about Uyghurs in Xinjiang, and they were persona non grata by the Chinese government. They lost all their research grants. They cannot go back to China. They cannot do this. So, this is what happens. You know, starting from a, some Stanford professor or some Harvard professor who don't, don't get the grant. I'm sure some Ryzen professor might not get a grant going there. Uh, if if Ryzen, if that professor would would write something that displeases China, that's how much control it is. The U.S. government does not control Harvard, but the Chinese government controls Beijing University and all the research that Didn't goes in. Didn't they not let Chelsea Manning speak there? I think there's a lot of influence. I mean, I'm with you. What? The U.S. <laughs> government has a lot of influence at Harvard. They not let Chelsea Manning speak? Didn't, isn't that right? Am I remembering? No, I don't incorrectly? think so. She, no. was, she was invited to speak there, and then she was disinvited. I think oh, so. Okay. Well, wait, Someone can Google that. Not. But anyway, I, I think but so. you're picking a too fine a point right now. No, I'm not. Oh, no. I'm you need to take the you. <laughs> I don't think but that Harvard I, I'm glad is you brought out. I'm glad you brought out the media, because I want to say something. Someone uh, Google yes. that. Uh, to, uh, Chinese, go with this one, and then we're going to move on to seconds. these guys. But yes, please go. Okay. There, uh, as you, the, we have a very vibrant Chinese media here. We have three. Uh, at one time, we had four, four daily newspaper. Uh, there's at least two over-the-air radio station and th two or three other internet radio stations, and of course two television <laughs> stations um, that serves the Chinese community. I can tell you very surely that only two outlets are free from uh, Chinese control, Chinese embassy control, Chinese consulate control, because the Chinese consulate can send people or themselves. They can call up the editor in chief and say, "Would you not put this story?" They don't even have to say anything. And one of the things that uh, the author, actually Denise Chong, who who wrote about uh, Perry Link, who said this, was China was like a big uh, the snake anaconda, sitting on top of a tree, and you're you're sitting under the tree trying to meditate or do do, do your own thing. 
but you're so aware. The, the snake's not going to do anything. It's going to sleep there. But you're so aware that there's a big snake sitting, sitting up there. And any false move that you make, be it media, be it dissent, be it uh, publication, the snake will jump down and you get killed, right? So that's a kind of projection of power that, and of the very dark kind that Chinese ex exerting uh, both to the Canadian society as well as to the Chinese Canadian community. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. We'd love to hear your observations, please.